childhood. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about Louis XIV, the absolutism of Louis XIV. He's famous for that quote there, uh, Le Castle La, my French is terrible. <laughs> Uh, but he is the state. And really, that's the way that, that a lot of absolute rulers view things at this point in time. That, uh, that they are the embodiment of the nation. You kind of saw that in the short lecture yesterday. So France is, at this point in time, the up-and-coming superpower of Europe. What was the superpower previous to France? Excellent. And you saw that Spain sort of exhausts itself. Even though Spain had a lot of, of one and two and three and four and five with new monarchy, especially five with new monarchy, five being the taking over of new territories, and then two, the revenue that comes from those territories, they seem to wear themselves out trying to make everybody Catholic in Europe, supporting you know the wrong cause, basically. Not engaging in trade and trying to improve their economy, but basically trying to force everybody with their silver from the New World to become Catholic again, and it doesn't work. Well, France is an up-and-coming superpower, as I said. It has the, the largest population of Europe at this point in time. This, this, the country itself is about the size of Texas, if you know how big Texas is. It's very large. And so about 19 million people or so, and uh, you and I consider it to be France, but quite frankly, it's not really France. And, and what I mean by that is... If you really divided it up politically, it would look more like the Holy Roman Empire in a way. Like somebody vomited Skittles, you know? Uh, it's not going to be until after the French Revolution when it really becomes a nation united where they have really more or less the same language and the same kind of system of law in, in all the places, all the same kind of uh, systems of weights and measurements and everything else. It is an area with differing rights, differing traditions. It's also a place that is wealthy in, um, in kind of a big sense. It's a fairly wealthy country, but not per person. In other words, there are some people who are fabulously, fabulously wealthy. Who are they probably? Maybe the monarch. The nobles, right? And then probably a, a, a small number of, of merchants as well. So those people are, are, are fairly wealthy, but let's face it, there are lots and lots of people who are just abjectly poor. Very poor peasants, uh, very poor urban dwellers. It just is, is a place that has a lot of poverty as well. So it gets wealthy this way through trade to some extent, probably less so initially than what you found in Spain, for example, with the New World. You know about France's New World possessions, right? Canada, for example. Um, not not as lucrative, not nearly as lucrative as what's going to be going on with the silver mines. So fairly wealthy, um, but not per capita. It has a representative body called the Estates General. We'll talk a lot about the Estates General when we talk about the French Revolution. We will not talk about it here because really once a powerful monarch takes over, or even somebody who is ruling for the powerful monarch, uh, somebody like one of the cardinals, Richelieu or Mazarin, you don't, they don't call this thing. They don't call the parliament. The Estates General stops being called in 1614, and then it will not be called again until 1789. If you think about new monarchy or new monarchy on steroids, which number is that? Dealing with the nobles' parliament or representative. Yes, number one, exactly. Number one is to control the parliament. Well, if you don't let the nobles meet in the parliament, voila, you're doing a really good job. They do have these things, though, called parlements, which are law courts. It sounds like, you know, a representative body. Eh, not so much. It's a bunch of nobles sitting together who are kind of uh, approving or rubber stamping whatever it is that the king wants. There isn't really an ability or a constitution to stand up to the monarch. It's just sort of all based on tradition. And so generally, the, the monarch makes the law and sends it to the parlement, and the parlement simply say, yeah, okay, that sounds good, stamp. It's good now in, in our region, the region that that parlement covers. There's a bunch of provincial estates too, where some nobles would might, they might get together and maybe send some feedback to the king about laws or what they might need and so on. 
But once again, there isn't a kind of constitutional fight so much between a monarch and then these various forms of, of representative institutions of, of an oligarchy. These aren't for common people. These are just for rich people or for nobles. These two cardinals, Richelieu and Mazarin, are the two guys who run France for a number of decades. You might remember when we did that DBQ, and we'll continue working on that DBQ, that Richelieu had, a, uh, had that image where he, he was um, picking the Huguenots off of, off of the, the, uh, the bush that was France, and then also restraining Austria and Spain. Richelieu is in charge under Louis XIII. Well, we won't talk too much about Louis XIII, because quite frankly, he doesn't do very much other than hunt and chase ladies. That's what monarchs want to do, and that's why they hire guys like this to do the actual business of government. Mazarin is the guy who is in charge when Louis XIV is a child. Louis XIII passes away. Uh, Louis XIV then becomes king as a child and kills him. Child kings usually don't do a very good job. They need somebody to help them out. It's Cardinal Mazarin at this point in time. There is a a kind of civil war that breaks out, or a rebellion that breaks out, uh, at the very beginning of Louis XIV's reign. And once again, this Cardinal Mazarin is in charge. The, this is a kind of, I, I call this a negative one, a minus one kind of conflict, which means that the nobles are trying to take power back away from the crown in this moment of weakness where you have a child king. The nobles who are rebelling against the government claim that they're not rebelling against the child king, they're rebelling against his evil advisor. This is actually something that happens a lot. When a group of people want to rebel against the king, they always say, if only the king knew what their evil advisor was doing, you know, he would change things. And we're not rebelling against the king, we're rebelling against this evil advisor. Well, they say that they're rebelling against Mazarin and not the child king Louis, they throw up barricades, there's some street fighting that's going on, noble leaders with bands of ex-soldiers, ex-mercenaries. If you see when it starts, 1648, does that tell you contextually what was what, what else is going on in 1648, or what else is no longer going on, John? Peace with Australia. Exactly. The Thirty Years' War is ending. They've got all these mercenaries coming home, all these ex-soldiers coming home. They want to be hired to continue to fight. They continue to fight either on the side of Mazarin or on the side of these nobles. Now, you might view this civil war as a kind of um, beginning of democracy in, in a weird way, that these nobles want to strip an absolute ruler of his absolute rule and maybe make a, a kind of sharing of power arrangement. But that's not really what they're about. Really what they're about is trying to, to reestablish feudalism where the king was really pretty weak, and the individual nobles throughout the countryside were the ones who were getting their law and their administration instead of the king's. At one point in time, some Spanish troops are called in. The Spanish are always willing to come in and mess with France. Some of the nobles said, why don't you come on ahead and you know help us out? We're going to overthrow Mazarin. We're gonna... And the Spanish were like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's weaken France. It doesn't particularly work out for them. And really, in the end, most of France turned against these nobles who were uh, just causing trouble and not trying to, you know, like I say, uh, create a more democratic state. They're just really adjusting to the rule. So the other classes withdrew support. Mazarin's forces were able to, to quell or to, uh, to stop this rebellion. And it's over. But it has an effect. It has a long-term effect. And it has a long-term effect on Louis XIV, the child king. It kind of looks like this. Just kind of a, a bit of fighting here and there, you know, troops on one side or the other. In, in a sense, it reminds me of the, uh, the war of religion in France, except that there is no, there is no religious element to this. Um, it's really just all about who's going to be in charge, Mazarin or a bunch of nobles. 
And there's, of course, different parts of France where it is more pronounced than others. Pardon? Where's Pierre Um, I, I don't know. Isn't that where it is? I think so. I thought Pierre said Oh, Pierre is definitely not in our center. Yeah, it's up. It's up there, approximately. I'm not wrong the map is. <laughs> but you can check it if you like to. Sure. Uh, here's what happens. And, and I'm going to tell you, I think, if, if I'm doing my job right, I'm going to tell you a few stories about when so-and-so the ruler was little, this happened, and this thing was a sort of formative influence on, um, on their lives. So... Little Louis is king. You know, he's five years old or something like that. And uh, the frondeurs, these rebellious nobles, were afraid, they said, that, that Mazarin had done something with the king, that, you know, he, he, was, he was gone and Mazarin was just ruling uh, without him or whatever. It's not true, but that's what they were saying. And so they go to this uh, palace where little Louis is, is living, and they break into the palace. You can imagine what Mazarin has told little Louis about this civil war and about the bad people who want to do him harm and so on. Well, uh, little Louis hides in his palace as he hears these nobles kind of stomping through the palace and trying to find him. Where is he? Where is he? And little Louis, I'm sure, is hiding under a bed or behind a curtain or something, and they find him. And I'm sure little Louis, like, you know, beat his pants or whatever, and he was just so frightened that they're going to kill him. They didn't want to kill him, they just wanted to allegedly assure that he was safe. But that frightened him so much that he said to himself in his little, you know, little kingly voice, someday when I'm real king, I'll never let the nobles scare me again. I'll never let them rule over me again. And that's basically what happened. Uh, when he has a chance to rule in, on his own, he does this wonderful job of, of being in charge, of getting control over the nobility. He believes that a weak king leads to chaos. And so when Mazarin passes away in 1661, everybody assumed that there was just going to be another cardinal in charge or some other person who's going to run the state. And so they said, uh, you know, your majesty, to whom should we address ourselves? Who, who, who should we talk to about running things? And, uh, and Louis XIV said, to so there's a great surprise, he'll talk to me. I'm in charge now. For real. And then he was. He is able to get, and, and I'll go through that, that same thing that I, I set up with you for the new monarchies. One, two, three, four, five. And then I'm going to give you a number six. Number one is controlling the nobility. And here's where I think he does a really wonderful job. Once again, we're coming out of a, a kind of background civil war uh, sort of, of, of situation. Um, even going back to the French Wars of Religion, where you had a bunch of nobles who were in opposition to the crown. So he needs to get control of these nobles. And what he does is he creates a palace. He creates a place where the nobles are expected to come to live and, uh, and, and to, spend, you know, to spend their time. Instead of being spread all throughout France, causing trouble in the countryside, plotting against the king, they're going to be right there with the king, staying busy. And I, I write big wigs. I mean that literally. Big wigs are, are very popular at this point in time. That's the fashion, right? All, all these noble guys are wearing these gigantic big wigs. Um, the really important nobles are expected to come to Versailles and live with the king. There's, a, there's lots and lots and lots of poverty-stricken nobles or, or not very high-ranking nobles who just remain in the countryside. They don't really matter, I think. So he expects that all of these very important nobles move to uh, Versailles, live with him there, and then he keeps them busy. He creates etiquette. He creates an infinite number of, of rules about how to live at Versailles. And... In doing so, these nobles who moved there all had to learn all of these rules. They get very busy learning these rules. They get very busy um, 
performing these, these acts, uh, ceremonial acts for the king or to the king. And, um, and anybody who, who was anybody, they thought over time, was serving the king. The king had, for example, uh, sort of uh, an odd um, ceremonial acts of getting up in the morning and, and eating and, uh, and then also going to sleep at night. And so basically what would happen is he would have a bunch of nobles who would be vying for the position of the person who helps him put his stockings on or the person who helps him put his shoes on or the person who's, who's helping him put his wig on. And these nobles are the ones who are doing this. This isn't just a bunch of servants. It's high-ranking nobles. And it's, it's a position. It's not like a random thing every day. Uh, Louis XIV sets up who his big wig guy is and who his stockings guy is. And everybody's kind of fighting over each other to get close to the king to be able to do those things. When you're close to the king, you could talk to the king. You cannot just be sort of his confidant and whatever and like, you know, whisper gossip in his ear and say how you might have a nephew who needs a job in the countryside and does the king perhaps have something for him. Um, people really, these nobles really um, feel like they are powerful when they can be close to the king. And so this is a wonderful way of separating power from grandeur. They think they're powerful when they're doing these things. They're not. They're being sort of bamboozled into thinking that. They should be. If they, if they were worth anything, like, they're, like their warrior ancestors were, they should be advising the king, standing up to the king, you know, going to war with the king, and so on. Uh, they're not. They are, they're, they're kind of like his lap dogs at this point in time. Besides that, they're constantly entertained. They're constantly kept busy. There's concerts. There's, you know, gambling. There's feasts. There's just everything that you can possibly imagine to keep these guys busy almost 24-7, 365 days out of the year. A wonderful way of taming the aristocracy, taming the nobility. Can't possibly imagine that there would be another frond in his adult life because he's tamed these nobles in the way that he has. You may have seen uh, Versailles before. You may have actually been there before. I, I, I envy you if you've been there. Um, it's a gigantic complex uh, created to really show off how Louis XIV is the center of everything. How his magnificent palace is, even the gardens are worked out this way, um, the center of all. He's the sun king. And they believe, well, they don't believe actually, what do you think? They're starting to believe that the sun is the center of the solar system. So that's, that's good. We'll talk about that very soon. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, look at this. He is so powerful that he's able to make water flow up. Does that make sense? With a fountain, you and I look at a fountain, we're like, sure, whatever. But think about how amazing a fountain is. Water flows down, unless you're so powerful that you could make it flow up and out. Or imagine what was what was here before they created these exquisitely manicured um, gardens. Well, what did it look like when this was just a little hunting shack? Well, okay, <laughs> hunting palace. Um, before they created that, what do you think it looked like? Woods. Yeah, just woods and fields. So look at what he's done. He has tamed nature. He has brought order to nature. And it's no, you know, it's no coincidence that they take a wild, or they take a plant and they manicure that plant so it looks the way that the king wants. Put it into a specific shape. Look at the straight angles of, uh, of you know, flat grass and so on. It's really wonderful. The king controls nature. So I, I've kind of taken this in my own life. And um, how many of you have to mow the lawn sometimes? Or, or, or weed? Or, yeah. So that's kind of annoying, right? My kids don't really like to do it either. But think about this. In a similar way that Louis XIV is able to control nature by creating order where there was natural chaos, that's exactly what you're doing. You know how, how wonderful the yard looks when you mow it all to the same height and before that it was all out of control and everything? Does that make you feel better about mowing the lawn? No. Perfect. Thank you. Good. Uh, it didn't work with my kids, so I just do it myself. So. I like the edge work. Oh, yeah. See? It is. It looks really nice when you're done. Yeah. 
Uh, you're godlike, really, is what you're doing. You're, <laughs> you're controlling nature. How did they move along? Uh, I think they clip it. Clip, 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 clip. Yeah. Yeah. They, imagine the army of people who are there as servants to serve all of the nobles and Louis XIV. Um, it's yeah. I think he probably has some some sort of rudimentary um, lawnmower as well. But it's it's a wonderful thing. And if we could look at it, the the palace would be in the center of things, and you'd have all these spokes going out everywhere, um, like a sun, really. And so it goes straight in this direction forever, and then on behind the palace, it's going straight for forever as well. Um, it, it's landscape gardening as a, a, a kind of like um, showcase of absolute monarchy, more powerful than, than nature itself. Very cool. Inside, too, uh, the idea is that an individual is overwhelmed by the grandeur of this, of this palace. Or you look at the giant... You can imagine that these giant works of art are all about Louis XIV in the Hall of Battle. So the various battles that uh, that Louis fought over his reign are captured in, uh, you know, captured in art and then placed as, as gigantic works in this uh, in this Hall of Battles. And so a little tiny person walking through it is just overwhelmed. Wow, Louis XIV truly is Mars, god of war. He truly is like the sun. You're just a little tiny person, even if you're a noble. There he is in 1701. He, uh, you know, he dresses in a way that makes you makes you feel like he's something extremely special. High heeled shoes. Apparently, there were little battle scenes painted on his high heeled shoes as well for people who aren't supposed to look at him. Right? A lot of people are not supposed to look up at him. If you're a commoner, you don't look at the king in the face. So you're, you're looking as he's riding by, perhaps, and so oh, that's cool. There's a little battle on his on his uh, on his heels, uh, and the giant wigs and and uh, the capes and all that kind of thing. Here he is, a, as I like to say, a wigged warrior in armor that really serves no purpose anymore, but it's a it's a harking back to the past. Well, that was number one. Number one is controlling the nobility, and he does a wonderful job, like I say, by creating Versailles and making all the nobles live there and turning them into lap dogs. Number two is revenue, gaining revenue. And he's got this guy by the name of uh, Jean-Baptiste Colbert. Colbert is his uh, finance uh, is his finance guy. He's the controller general of finances. And Colbert is famous for the creation of something called mercantilism. I'll give you a slide on mercantilism in just a second. Colbert needs to marshal the economy to support Louis XIV's not just lavish lifestyle, which is really pretty inexpensive compared to what really all states spend a lot of money on, his military. So he's trying to get as much money in the king's treasury as possible. So he creates this thing called uh, mercantilism. There's also something going on at this period of time called tax farming, in which people are hired or, or offer their services to be tax farmers. They are the ones. Individuals go around collecting taxes for the king and then turn over much of that money to the king, but not all of it. And that's how they get paid. So they're not civil servants or bureaucrats. They're kind of like independent contractors. It's not a great way of collecting money, but in a period of time where you don't really have a civil service to do that, you can do your best. Uh, Colbert creates a French East India company, perhaps stealing the idea from the Dutch. It just doesn't work out quite as successfully as what the Dutch had. Here's what mercantilism really is. Mercantilism is all about improving the economy. Now, don't you think that all rulers, all leaders, want to improve the economy of their place? But I would say that nowadays, when, uh, when the president wants the economy to run well, I think the president wants the economy to run well for the people's sake, for rich people's sake. And, you know, everybody should be doing better. That's not what mercantilism is about. The people don't matter. What matters is the king, the monarch. And so mercantilism is trying to improve the economy for the monarch's sake. It's a kind of absolutist way of running the economy. And there's a belief in mercantilism that wealth is just based on silver and gold and how much silver and gold you might have in your treasury. 
So their their desire is get a whole huge, whole huge amount of silver and gold. I like to imagine this is kind of weird, but this is how I try to imagine things. Or how I remember things. I like to imagine Colbert and Louis the Fourteenth. Uh, jumping in, they have this room that's filled with gold and silver coins, and they're rolling around in the gold and silver coins, and they're throwing it up in the air, and they're just laughing because they have so much gold and silver. I imagine them naked, so it makes it like stick in my head more because I'm just going to do something else. I don't choose anything. So they're having a really good time throwing gold at each other. How do you get gold? How do you get silver? Well, they think the way to do it is to export to other countries and not import anything. If they export French wines to the Dutch, the Dutch maybe have to pay, pay with that for with gold and silver, right? Now the Dutch might, in, in exchange, want to do tulips instead, and that would drive that would drive uh, Colbert and Louis XIV crazy because they just want they can't be rolling around in tulips, they need to be rolling around in the gold and silver that the Dutch gave them. So they're trying to export and not import. They throw high tariffs up actually on products from the outside. In addition to all that, they try to improve uh, improve the economy by, by reducing internal tariffs. They don't want that if somebody's trying to sell something in another province that they'd have to pay a toll or, or some sort of you know uh, extra fee because it's a different place from where they came from. They build roads, they build canals, and, uh, and that, of course, faci facilitates the movement of, of products and agricultural goods. And then they also, and all working tools do this, they all want to have colonies that can only trade with the mother country. This is something that gets the, the English or the British in trouble with us around the time of our, uh, of our revolution. So just a, a kind of mother, daughter, father, son, whatever, um, colonial monopoly on trade. Well, this works to some extent because Louis XIV is fighting lots and lots and lots of wars. And he's having to, you know, raise revenue in various ways. He raises taxes on uh, nobles. There's always a problem with doing that. What do you think happens when, when taxes get raised? Revolt. <laughs> Maybe a revolt. Certainly unhappy people. Once again, if it's a period of time when the people don't matter very much, there's no elections or anything like that, who cares? Uh, but still, they're, they're not happy with Louis XIV. He also borrows money. Uh, sometimes that gets paid back well. Sometimes it doesn't get paid back very well at all. He devalues the currency. Sometimes what they do is they create new coins, but not having the same amount of silver or gold. They might put in some, some metal that is maybe less valuable. He also sells offices. This is something the French do for a long period of time. If you want to be tax collector in a place, if you want to be part of the Parlement, if you want to serve the king in some sort of, of government position, you have to buy that position from him first, you become tax exempt, and then you're going to be paid by the state after that. It's kind of a, 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 a law of diminishing returns, though. You get a bunch of money up front from somebody, and then they're tax, they're tax exempt, so you're not going to be getting any more money. So it's, it's not always a great way of doing it. In terms of law and administration, just like with the new monarchy, they're trying to avoid having nobles run the state. And so they hire a bunch of middle class people, put them in a kind of uh, advisory council to advise the king. They're happy to do that. They're happy to make money doing that. They feel very close to the king and very powerful because of that. And they do whatever he wants because they're not nobles. They're just part of the bourgeoisie. As I mentioned, too, he never calls the estates general. Doesn't want that to have to, have to he doesn't want to have to contend with a bunch of nobles parlaying or talking with them, telling him some things that he might not want to hear. Once again, this is what is going to get the English king in trouble a little bit before this period of time. Paul in Parliament. He also has a bunch of officials called Entendants. These are his officials that he's sending out from Paris, spreading out through all the countryside, through all the different provinces of, of France, to do whatever he says. He's not relying on local people to get his law in order. He's relying on his own people who show up and oftentimes have to force local people to do what he wants. And then finally, he creates this, or he has to create a 
a military bureaucracy, a whole bunch of civilian people, people who are not soldiers, but who are there to recruit soldiers, to house soldiers, to outfit soldiers, to, to organize the training of soldiers. It's a much more professional way of doing things, a more, more modern way of doing things. Too. You think about the largest, I think this is still the truth, the largest building in the United States. What do you think? World Trade Center. World Trade Center. World Trade Center. Nah, it's actually the Pentagon. The, the civilian and military bureaucracy that keeps our military afloat. In terms of number four, uh, in terms of, of religious conformity or controlling religion, Louis bans a kind of uh, supposedly Catholic movement called Jansenism. A number of Catholics had gravitated towards this thing, this, this belief called Jansenism, named after a guy by the name of Cornelius uh, Jansen. Jansenism, uh, once again, these people are supposed to be Catholic, but Jansenism says that um, God is so powerful that he sort of predetermined who's damned and saved at the beginning of time. Have you heard of some have you heard of something like that before? Yeah, basically Jansenism is kind of like Catholicism with a, a too much a, too much Calvinism in it. Louis doesn't like that. He wants religious conformity. He's taught or he believes that this is a, a, a wrong belief, and he bans it outright in 1660. The Pope bans it afterwards. The Pope is taking his religious views from Louis XIV at that point in time. Then Louis thinks about the, the, the historical past of France and the fight against the Huguenots, and he decides to start a campaign of harassment against the Huguenots. He doesn't like that there is a non-Catholic minority that's standing up to his power and, and not believing the same thing that, that he believes. And so they start to harass the Huguenots in the 1680s, making it more difficult for them to educate their kids, to engage in business. Uh, in the end of, of this harassment campaign, people were taking Huguenot babies at birth and running them down to the local Catholic church and baptizing them as Catholics and then bringing them back to their parents and saying, here's your baby. We baptized it Catholic. Wow, what a violation, right, of, of, basic, of basic rights. In the end, though, he revokes the Edict of Nantes. He revokes the ability for Huguenots to even live in France. And he tells them, this happens so often, he tells them, you have two choices. Convert to Catholicism or leave. And many of them leave. And this is a really bad deal for France because they were oftentimes very successful people. As you know, Calvinists oftentimes are. So the persecution led to immigration and uh, right on. He thought this was great. Let's face it, it just weakened France. He also created a modern military. And this is, this is um, something that had been going on for a little while in different countries, but Louis really makes it happen. He creates, as I said, a military bureaucracy. He also then, instead of just grabbing mercenaries in a kind of Wallenstein way, you know, you're going to hang or you're going to join the military, they create a system of training that is uniform or it's the same for all French soldiers. They equip French soldiers in a similar way. They supply them from the state. They have the same kinds of weapons, uniforms, and integrated artillery and integrated cavalry. No longer do you have an ambulance service. No longer do you have a sort of chaotic mercenary armies of the Thirty Years' War, but a professional military that has a hierarchy that everybody on the battlefield knows every single soldier who's higher or lower than them with something on their uniform, you know, like a number of stripes on their sleeve. People know who is on their side and not on their side as they start to create colors. You know, I think already, what colors, uh, what color do the British start to wear? for their army. Yeah. Red, right? So everybody has a kind of color that they start to use so that people can be uh, readily identified on the battlefield. They start to have lieutenants and lieutenant colonels. These are people who are professional military men. Forever they were selling, in various countries, they were selling commissions 
for people. Like if you wanted to command a, a unit of soldiers, you would recruit a unit of soldiers. Or you might buy a unit of soldiers from the king. You, you might want to be a colonel or a captain of some sort of military unit. You're a nobleman, you, you want to lead guys in battle, so you do that. It's great, except that maybe you knew nothing about the military or strategy or tactics, and you did a terrible job. So they keep selling these commissions to people. They keep saying, oh, you're, you're the colonel, you're the captain of the king's 22nd Dragoons. But in reality, they just had those, those people stay back in Versailles and not go into the battlefield. And then they had lieutenants, somebody in lieu of the captain who's supposed to be in charge, a real professional military person in charge, or a lieutenant colonel in lieu of, instead of, a real professional military man. It's a great way of still collecting money from big wigs who just wanted to say that they were in charge of a military unit, but then having a professional person in charge. Louis is able to increase the number of soldiers in his army from about 100,000 to the largest army in Europe, 400,000 during his reign. It's a big, big army. Probably the biggest army that we've seen ever, if not classical times in other places. Louis engages in wars for 33 of the 55 years that he's in power. And the, the wars are always kind of the same. He's always picking on the Dutch. He's always trying to nibble away over here on his eastern frontier, nibbling away at the territory of the Dutch, nibbling away at the territory of the Holy Roman Empire. The Dutch fight against France by grabbing allies and fighting back with their low interest rates that they're getting from the Bank of Amsterdam. They're able to stave off, um, stave off his, uh, his attacks. And he only gets, he nibbles, like I said, he gets bits and pieces of territory. But there are other people who are coming along later who will create, who will grab so much more territory it makes Louis XIV kind of look pathetic. Probably the person that you can think of in the 19th century who does that in a wonderful way. It's over most of Europe, coming out of France. But then he says, hope. Around this period of time, uh, there is a last Habsburg ruler of Spain. His, his, he's uh, Charles II of Carlos, and uh, you can see by his, his portrait, there's, there's something wrong with him. There are a lot of things wrong with him, actually. He is terribly inbred. The Habsburgs like to marry Habsburgs. You might have seen that when, uh, when Bloody Mary married Philip II of Spain. Uh, this guy is related to um, this guy is related to Juana la Loca, who was one of the daughters of uh, of Ferdinand and Isabella, in forty different ways. So this is like multiple generations of cousins and uncles and aunts and so on marrying each other. Uh, he's not right. He's not normal. He is developmentally disabled. People at that period of time thought he was bewitched, so they called him the bewitched or the possessed. Uh, at Echisado, and uh, he doesn't die forever. He keeps living uh, in spite of all of his infirmities. And finally, uh, he does pass away. He's got a couple of sisters who are normal and, uh, and married off to either the French or married off to the Habsburgs of Austria. Anyway, um, it, was, it was before his death, it was decided that when he passed away, Spain and Spanish territories would kind of be divided equally between the Habsburgs of Austria and Louis XIV. Well, when he died, a will was discovered. Maybe that's what he has in his hand there. And the will said, everything's going to go to Louis XIV's family. Spain, the New World, parts of Italy, you know, all of it's going to go to Louis XIV, who's already caused all of these wars. That creates a war of Spanish succession. This is a coalition war between Great Britain, the Netherlands, Austria, Prussia against France and Spain. It's a world war or a European-wide war, and it lasts for a good 12 years or so. It's fought in North America. It's fought in India. So, like I said, it's kind of like a world war. It's really big. And the French keep basically losing battles, but they're able to stay in the fight for a long period of time. In the end, there's this piece of Utrecht, 
in which the English get some stuff. Uh, they more or less win the war. They got the Rock of Gibraltar at the entrance and exit of the Mediterranean. They got North America, more territory in North America. And they got the ability to bring slaves to Spanish Central and South America. The Austrian Habsburgs got to take over the Spanish Netherlands, which is Belgium today. They got Lombardy in, in, uh, in what becomes Italy. And here's what France gets after fighting for 12 years. They got somebody who's related to Louis XIV as King of Spain. So somebody from the Bourbon family is both king of France and, and also king of Spain. That sounds great, but they made sure that this wouldn't really pan out for the French by saying that they could never be the same person. You can't have one king of a place called Frane or France. They, they have to be separate lines of kings and queens. If Louis would have been able to win this war of Spanish succession, he would have been a hegemon. He could have perhaps dominated all of Europe. So this is a very important war. I think with Louis XIV, he is, like I say, Kind of model of a really good absolutist ruler. He's able to do number one and two and three and four and five, and then this new number six. The new number six is this modern military. And with those six things, he's able to control France in a very powerful way. And I think it really just works because of his personality. When you see the next guy come along, his great grandson, in fact, uh, Louis the the Fifteenth, does not do a good job, and his great great grandson, Louis the Sixteenth, does a terrible job. This guy, with his own personality, with his own characteristics, is able to control France in a way that nobody else can for a long period of time. After he dies. The aristocrats come back. There's kind of a negative one sort of thing that happens, where the aristocrats say, oh, uh, you know, the very powerful king is gone. We want to help rule now. They don't know how to do it, though. They become lapdogs. And so they don't do a very good job either. And France is a bit of a mess for a while. After Louis XIV, we have the 15th and the 16th. They're definitely weaker kings. And it gets so weak that at some point in time, there's going to be a revolution because they just can't keep Louis XIV's absolutes in the future. What questions are you?